because I'm building that um, relationship, because I'm building that trust. I think more of these company CEOs enjoy engaging with me and then enjoy meeting a broader set of folks within progress. You know, one of the nice things here at Progress is my CEO is more than happy to get on the phone with any of the target companies that we're looking at. And that helps me a lot too, because one, it shows that we're serious. Um, and two, you know, it gives those target companies visibility at the highest level within progress. And that makes them feel good and makes them feel important. And I think that helps a lot. Um, and so, you know, doing those different things, I think for the most part gets most CEOs or whoever it is I'm talking to at target companies interested, willing, and happy to have good dialogue. Hi, I'm your host, Kisan Patel, CEO and founder of m and Science. Today, I'm here with Jeremy Siegel, Executive Vice President, Corporate Development at Progress. Progress Software offers software for creating and deploying business applications traded on NASDAQ under PRGS. Today, we're going to discuss the process of buying a business, specifically between the first conversation and getting an LOI the people involved, the steps in this process, and how to balance speed and accuracy during the bid process. How's it going, Jeremy? It's going great, Kisan. Thanks for having me. Always a, a pleasure to speak with you about fun M&A topics. I know you've been on here a number of times. Can we get the, the 60 second of your background? Sure. And real quick, I've been doing corporate development for over 20 years. Um, mostly in the Boston tech scene, first at Akamai, then at Log Me In, and now the last two and a half years at Progress Software, where I'm responsible for basically executing on our inorganic growth strategy to being a billion dollar software company, primarily driven by m and I wanted to get your time today to talk about the process of getting from this first conversation to an actual bid on the table. Because I think there's a lot that goes on there and it's not the same for every deal or company at that. It's Do a great, it's a that? great, yeah, it's a great topic, Kisan, um, and one that I definitely am um, happy to talk to you about here today um, because it is so important and it's not, I think people take for granted that, oh, you just went right into an LOI and with a company and then you go acquire the company. But there's so much work behind the scenes that builds up to that point where you can actually submit a letter of intent or an indication of interest. And for me, it really starts with relationship building and building trust um, and getting to know the company. Um, the last thing I wanna do is get on an initial call with a target company and say, hey, you know, we're interested in buying you. What do you think? It's more, hey, you know, would love to tell you a little bit more about progress and would love to hear a little bit more about your company. And then from there, see if maybe there's some interesting things that we can explore together. And that could be partnerships um, or it could be something more strategic like m and But you never want to just jump right into the deep end and be like, hey, we want to acquire you. Is that something you'd be interested in? So, you know, a lot of relationship building, a lot of dialogue, you know, there are times when that relationship building piece can take three, six, nine months before you even have a conversation that um, that that is circles around uh, an actual acquisition. And I think that you know, as these target companies learn more about progress and get excited about what progress could mean for the future of their business, they get more and more interested in having that strategic conversation. When I'm having that initial call with them, most of them don't even know who Progress is. And so it's just as much of me educating them on who Progress is as it is them educating me on who they are. Um, and I take a lot of pride in, in, in spending quality time with the companies in you know, having dinners, having drinks with CEOs of companies and getting to know them on a personal level. And I find that that kind of effort um, pays dividends down the road when you shift gears from, hey, it's great to meet you to, hey, what about doing something more strategic? Step one is build your relationship. 
that building relationship is so key because, you know, you want that target company to trust you. Um, you want that target company to um, have enthusiasm of engaging uh, with you. But we had a situation recently where, you know, we'd been talking to this one company for a couple of years. Um, and over the course of that time period, they got to know more and more of our team. They got to meet our CEO. They got to meet our GMs of our different business units. And, you know, at one point the light bulb goes off and they're like, hey, you know, maybe we could do something more strategic with you. That's the great, that's the great scenario that they bring it up as opposed to me bringing it up. Um, and, and that happens. And so I think that, you know, giving them exposure to more people within your company um, gives them better visibility into who you are as a potential acquirer um, and gets them more comfortable to have that conversation and gets them more comfortable to introduce us to a broader set of their people. Um, and that's how we get to know the company better. We get to know their team better. And as we've talked about on previous podcasts, the importance of people, it's so huge. Um, and so when you have those kinds of relationships in place, it just gives you greater conviction, greater confidence that a deal can be successful. Are there any milestones or specific tactics or anything at this point of relationship building that you're setting up to get to that point? Hey, let's talk about a serious deal. It's funny that you ask that. I wouldn't say there are any specific milestones that I set. It's not as if I say, all right, after one month, I want to make sure that we're having a conversation around sales and go to market. After two months, I want to be make sure I'm having a conversation around the product and technology. It really um, it, it has to be fluid. And it really depends on the target company. It depends on their willingness to engage in those kinds of conversations. Um, but it's, it, it's sort of a learning process we're learning different aspects of that company, but it really varies from one opportunity to the next. You know, some might be more formal where they're like, hey, you know, we'd love to give you an, after you have an initial call, we'd love to give you a demo because a lot of company CEOs are so excited about their technology. They say, hey, maybe a great next step will be, let's do a demo. And then you get some of your technical people from, from progress on a call to basically see what this technology is all about. And, you know, if my technical guys come back, um, technical team comes back and says, hey, that's really cool technology. We'd love to learn more. Then we can come back to them and say, hey, there seems to be something interesting here. Let's explore it further. Maybe there's a partnership opportunity for us. You know, one of the great things that Progress has is we have 100,000 enterprise customers. We have three and a half million developers that use our tools on a daily basis. Now, these startup companies, these early stage companies, would, would kill for that kind of distribution. And so there are ways to sort of leverage our platform to get these companies excited. Um, but, you know, I do not have a formal playbook per se um, as to how I engage with these companies other than that, you know, sometimes it starts with the CEO of the target company itself. Sometimes it starts with talking to their lead investor. Um, so there are multiple avenues that we can take to getting to know about a company. Um, and in each situation varies. So there's two big themes I'm pulling out of this. One is around trust. You're getting to know them. You're sharing information back and forth. You're getting exposure to people on both sides of each organization. Then the other is discovery. Mm -hmm. You're really learning. You're sounds like you're shaping some of the, the strategy, maybe even validating if you had a hypothesis in doing this discovery, you can demo your solution, we'll demo ours. Um, and th this is where some of those ideas, be it partnership, or maybe it, it positions it to be an acquisition, sort of all comes into shape. Does that sound right? So it, it's a really good synthesis of what I was saying. And yeah, that discovery piece is, it's a really good way of sort of describing it. Um, because yeah, we're, we're learning about that company. Um, and we're assessing whether or not this could be interesting. Uh, the nice thing about progress is because we cast such a wide net with regards to what it is that we look for um, across infrastructure software. <clears throat> you know, we can look at a lot of things, but it's still important for us to understand what those businesses do um, and how they could fit within a respective business unit or a respective product of progress. Um, and, and that takes time. And, and as, as you know, I'm not a super technical person by background, so I'm 
very dependent on the technical people, the experts within progress to help me evaluate um, these companies, like you said, discover and learn more about them. And, you know, it's also a great way for us to sort of weed out what isn't going to work for us because we tend to have a very, very broad top of funnel. Lots of companies that are at the top of the funnel. Um, and through this discovery and learning more about these companies, we're able to narrow it down to a much smaller subset of companies that we actually want to engage with um, at a more detailed level and potentially get to that point where we're having discussions around a letter of intent or an indication of interest. How much of a hypothesis do you have going to that first conversation that this would be a great company for us to acquire versus I just want to see what's going on there. Yeah, the hypothesis is usually pretty high level um, out of the gate. Um, you know, we do a pretty good job at progress of sort of identifying the adjacencies, the interesting areas across all the different products that we have at progress. So, you know, we have a general idea that, hey, you know, if we're talking to a company in the observability space, that is probably going to have some interesting relevance to what we're doing with a couple of different products that we have at progress. Um, but, you know, we don't necessarily know a lot. We don't know if the go-to-markets are aligned. We don't know if they're built in some other type of technology that's going to make it easy to integrate into progress. So there's a lot that we don't know. So it's really sort of a high level hypothesis. Is this an interesting adjacency where we think there could be an, a, a relevant strategic rationale that we can develop um, as we learn more? And that's really the impetus for those initial calls. Um, and it's not much more than that. I mean, unless it's a company that is going through a process and we have more details and we have financial data and things like that, where we can sort of run an analysis and say, hey, we think we can afford this company. It fits within our financial criteria. Let's go dig in more. Um, but those are more, more formal process type um, situations. When we're more proactively reaching out to companies, it's very, very high level when we initially talk to them. Uh, so you're, we're still doing discovery. You have some of these broad, high level hypotheses, And this is when you're understanding, go to markets are aligned with more information. You're doing your diligence. Yeah, and we and we have a very very sort of basic template for that initial conversation. Like there are certain things that we're looking for when we have that initial conversation. So obviously we want to understand what the company history is, um, but we want to get a better feel for you know what kind of products they have, how how big of a team they have, are they a distributed workforce, are they uh, in the office type workforce. Um, what, um, how much te technology is built on open source. So there are a whole bunch of things that we can ask that can help us to sort of determine if you know, a company is going to be interesting and relevant to us or not pretty quickly. Like for us at Progress, we're not doing technology tuck-ins. So we're not, so if a company, if we have a conversation with a company and they're like, no, yeah, we hope to start generating revenue next year. Well, we know that that's probably not gonna be a good fit for Progress. We can probably end those discussions pretty quickly. But, you know, if we learn that the company has a meaningful amount of revenue um, and hit some of the other criteria, we know that we can continue to have dialogue and have it be meaningful and productive for both our side um, and the target potential target company side. What do you do to get them to like you? <laughs> That's a great question. I like to think that I'm a likable guy just out of the gate, um, but, you know, I think it goes back to the first point when you talked about trust and discovery. Um, it's sort of building that trust. It's just having a good dialogue. Um, and you know, I spend time before I get on a first call looking at LinkedIn, seeing if I have connections to the person and being able to sort of make like little tie-ins like, hey, you went to Cornell, I went to Cornell, um, it, or whatever it might be. Um, and I think that sort of those icebreakers sort of um, make those conversations go more smoothly. Um, and I think a lot more of those target company CEOs or whomever I'm talking to, you know, enjoy engaging with me more as opposed to, you know, that point I made early in this conversation, you know, just coming up and saying, hey, we're progress. I run corporate development. I want to buy you. And that would probably create a different tone. But because I'm building that um, relationship, because I'm building that trust, I think more of these company CEOs enjoy engaging with me and then enjoy meeting a broader set of folks within progress. You know, 
one of the nice things here at Progress is my CEO is more than happy to get on the phone with any of the target companies that we're looking at. And that helps me a lot too, because one, it shows that we're serious. Um, and two, you know, it gives those target companies visibility at the highest level within progress. And that makes them feel good and makes them feel important. And I think that helps a lot. Um, and so, you know, doing those different things, I think for the most part, gets most CEOs or whoever it is I'm talking to at target companies interested, willing, and happy to have good dialogue with me. The hit rate is not 100% Keyson. Don't get me wrong. There, there's certainly some companies that, you know, just have no interest. They sort of know because I'm a corp dev person where this is ultimately going to go and they just have no interest in, in engaging and that's fine. Um, but for the most part, they're open to that conversation. I think given today's market environment, they have to be. It's harder to raise money. There's no IPO window open right now. Um, and so we as an acquirer are a great liquidity alternative for a lot of these companies that they're engaging. Building the relationship, developing trust, doing the discovery. When does that threshold come when it's, hey, time to get serious? Because I would assume that you would step up your diligence to put an offer in front of them. And there's got to be this, yeah, we'd like to see what terms you'd propose for a deal. Like where, where does that little point happen? Yeah, I think, you know, especially for companies that are VC backed or PE backed, you know, the the partners um, on those deals um, with those companies are going to be very protective of those companies and very protective of their team and them, you know, focusing on executing. So you're right, at some point, uh, the rubber hits the road and, you know, you have to basically say to the private equity person or the VC person, you know, we've really enjoyed these conversations that we've had with this company. We think that you know there could be something more strategic here, um, and you know, we can determine a, a view or perspective on value with not a ton of information. If we can get a basic financial pack, an anonymized census, um, you know, we can run a valuation model that has us be able to say, all right, we think we can support a deal in such and such range. And so I can have that conversation with the VC or the PE. If it's a bootstrap company directly with the CEO of the company and say, hey, you know, these conversations I think are going really well. Um, there could be interest in doing something more strategic. Um, is that something that you'd be interested in? Um, and with the VCs and the PEs, you can say, hey, you know, these conversations have been going really well. We think we could do a deal um, somewhere in this range. And, you know, we know you've raised X, um, we typically know what the, the post money valuation on the last round is. And so we, we have a feel for whether or not we can put in something that would be compelling to a VC or private equity firm and be able to say, hey, we think we can do a deal at X. Is that something that you'd want to engage further in? Because, you know, when we get to that LOI stage, um, we haven't really gotten a chance to do a lot of diligence. You know, we've done, you know, a couple of management calls maybe, but we haven't really dug in on the technology. We haven't really dug in on the uh, on the, the sales and go-to-market details, pipeline, things like that. We haven't done much at all on the back office side. So around HR, around IT, around legal, around finance. So there's a lot that we need to do that we can't do until we get to that LOI point. And so, you know, we need to make it interesting enough to the VCPE person that they're willing to say, all right, company X, company Y, let's open up the kimono to progress at this point because you know, this is a price that would be interesting to us. And if we could get a deal at this price, it's worth it. Um, and so we'll have that dialogue with the, the respective person on the other side. And if it resonates, you know, we can jump right into an LOI. How does that originate? Are you dealing with the management team to get to the VCPE? Are you talking to them directly? It really, it, it's a good question. It really depends um, on a deal by deal basis. You will typically, you know, what I like to do is I like to sort of find a soft landing. I don't like to do cold calling and just reach out to someone out of the blue. So I like to see where do I have connections? Who can I leverage to give me a nice introduction? And, you know, lots of times that's with the, VC or the private equity person, and I'll ask my contact who I'm connected to you to say, hey, would you mind doing a warm intro to so-and-so? Um, because I'd be interested in talking to this company. 
Um, but, you know, instead of just going directly to the CEO of the company, I might go to the VC or the PE if I have a relationship there. If I have a good connection to the company and I can get a nice warm intro to the CEO of that company, I'll do that too. But I try to um, have that initial contact be warmer as opposed to just a, a cold call outreach that tends to have a much lower hit rate of success. Okay. So wherever your warm sources lead you into. Yeah. Through the business yeah. or the investors. Yeah. And if it's on the investor side, it's, it's more, it, you typically will say, Hey, we're interested in your company X. Um, we think that there's some interesting tie-ins to a product that we might have a progress or to progress as a whole. And we think that what, progress brings some interesting things to the table. And we'd love to just have a preliminary conversation to get to know the company better. And again, yeah. I'm never coming out and saying, hey, we want to acquire this company. They ultimately know what it is I'm trying to do, but you know, they know that it's a process. It's, it's a, a courting process. Um, and you know, if I can do a good enough job sort of explaining why it could be interesting, um, usually the VCs or the PEs are more than happy to make that intro. And if I do a good enough job, um, with the CEO, him or herself, they're usually more than willing to have that initial conversation. And then you do relationship building, build the trust discovery, get to the point where, hey, I think we got something here. We like to propose something formally in front of you, basically proposing the idea. When we have, after we have that initial conversation, um, if there's interest in continuing to have dialogue, we'll sign an NDA then. So the NDA has been signed a long pretty time. Early. Yes. So pretty yes. early, like, but, hey, we are going to not yeah, each other stuff. I'm not going to say, I'm not going to say, hey, I want to talk to you. Let's sign an NDA and then we'll set up a time to talk. I'll usually have that initial conversation. And if there's some there there, then say, hey, you know, as a next step, maybe we should sign an NDA. And so we can talk a little more freely and openly. Um, and we can share a little bit more about each other that we might not otherwise be able to share. Um, without that NDA. So that NDA is 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 long in place when we're having a discussion around LOI. Do we get to that point where we want to put something in for we're already getting some information? But to put an LOI together, you need some financials and a pretty good amount of information, wouldn't you? Well, and like I said, when 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 we're at that stage, we've typically already gotten the financial pack. And so that will have uh, details around a PL, details around a balance sheet, details around um, recurring revenue streams, you know, details around um, the operating expenses and the cost of goods sold. So we have decent details oh, for, there. For them to send you that, then they know their expectation is you're they're sending that information to put together an offer. Um, yes, typically. Um, typically, um, yeah. So for sure that that um, that would be the case. And so you know, sometimes we'll just have a much more high level um, financial detail, but we can build a valuation perspective on high level information. And then what we say is, we'll obviously need to validate this um, with diligence and more detail. But you know, at a high level, we think we can do something in this range, unless we learn things in diligence that prove that your revenue is significantly less than what you told us, or your expense profile is significantly higher than what you told us. Um, you know, we should be able to do a valuation in such and such a range. But you're right; um, there are situations where you know we're not going to get that level of detail, and but we can still sort of put together a preliminary perspective on what we think an appropriate value could be. Well, this is probably where it varies a bit company to company in terms of how easy it is to get that information or willing to share it. Yes, absolutely. Like in a competitive situation, if it's a banker led process, we have access to a lot more information. We'll typically have a, a, a more robust data room um, established already so we can get some of that information to be able to do some of that preliminary diligence. If it's a more proactive approach where we've, re we've reached out to the company and they're not necessarily in an M&A process, um, then it takes a little bit more courting time, a little bit more time to build that trust. And then, you know, if we get to that point where you know, we're thinking there could be something more strategic here, you know, we can ask for some of those things that I talked about, uh, that financial pack that allows us to um, submit a more meaningful letter of intent. But a letter of intent, you know, as a non-binding document doesn't have to be that detailed. Um, I mean, it's not as if you're negotiating um, indemnities and escrows um, at an LOI point, you're saying, hey, I think I can do something in the price range of this. Um, you know, this is the diligence that I still need to do. I'd like to have some period of time for exclusivity to be able to go hire all the third-party resources that I'm going to need to be able to do this work. 
um, and and see if we can go negotiate a deal while we're doing that diligence. Um, so, can you walk me through the people that are involved to get to LOI? You know, you're you're having a first conversation, and maybe you got a colleague or or so. Then, mm-hmm. but then going from there to LOI, who are the people that get out? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. We typically have a pretty limited set of folks that are involved up to the point where we sign a letter of intent. Um, So obviously we'll have legal involved because they're helping us to negotiate the letter of intent. Um, We have some folks in the finance team involved because they're helping us to um, build out the financial model. Um, We'll have whoever is going to be the executive champion and maybe one or two people from his or her team that are involved evaluating the company from a technology and a go-to-market standpoint. And that's typically it. So it's pretty. It's typically pretty limited. And similarly, um, with the target companies, they're not bringing a bunch of people over the wall because they don't want people to get all nervous that they're about to be sold or something like that. So it's typically the CEO, the CFO, maybe a chief revenue officer or a chief product officer. So it's usually very limited on the target side, but it's also pretty limited on our side as well as the buyer. Um, once we execute that LOI, that's when we bring in the much more um, robust diligence team across all the different functions. So on, on your side, you said it was legal, a number of executives. And then and our finance team that's helping us to build a model. Finance team, HR? Um, not typically. They're not typically too involved pre-LOI. Um, I have a good relationship with my chief people officer, so she's aware of the different deals. I also have a couple people on her team that dotted line into me, so they're aware of the deals, but they're not necessarily doing a lot of work pre LOI. How do you engage them? Because what I'm trying to get to is ultimately you got to put an offer and your big considerations around the offer are your CapEx and synergies. I'm I'm just I'm curious yeah. about this, right? Yeah, because- no, it's a great question because yeah, because we're making certain assumptions and and it's a, it's a good point. Um, it's we not are a big making- thing you want to change the price after you got an LOI signed, right? We do not. We we do not. We, and we we are very very focused on you know we'll we'll walk away from a deal rather than retrade on price um, typically um, because once we set a price or a range, we don't want to back off. So you know, we, we have good conviction because we know, um, having done this as long as we have, you know, where we can get good operational efficiencies. You know, we know at Progress, um, you know, as a percentage of revenue, um, how much G&A we really need to operate a business successfully, how much sales and marketing we really need to operate a business successfully. So we know where there are going to be synergy opportunities when we have sort of a high level P&L. And so we'll make general assumptions if we get into diligence and we conclude that, you know, we need a lot more of that team or we're not going to be able to um, get to the kind of operating margin profile that we expect and need to have to get a deal done we'll walk away from a deal, but you know, we've done this enough that we know um, what we can do. Um, and so we have a high level of conviction that we're gonna be able to get a deal across the finish line um, if we've gotten some of that basic information before we get to um, an LOI stage. And then the, the diligence process is really confirmatory and validating what we've assumed. How do you bring in, keeping that in mind, then how do you engage those people that you need to, to validate your CapEx and synergies to make sure you're bidding accurately. Yeah, we have a core, we have a core diligence team across all the different functions. Um, we've spent a lot of time over the last couple of years since I've been here, really building up the bench across each of the different functional areas that evaluate a company, whether that's- well, All, the all these functional leads are involved before LOI. What's that? No, um, the functional leads are not involved. Remember, one up until the point where we execute an LOI, the team that's been involved is very is, is much smaller. It's it's the legal team that's helped me to negotiate the LOI. It's the finance team that's helped me build a model, um, and it's the executive sponsor, maybe one or two people from his or her team. Um, so that's that that's the extent. Then when we get to that LOI stage, then we bring in a much broader set of folks to help us dig in and and, and dig under the covers um, to really truly understand the business um, you know, and do it both from a standpoint of confirmatory diligence, but also what do I need to know to map out a really um, detailed and thoughtful integration plan so that once, if once we do get to the finish line, you know, that, that company will get integrated into progress in a seamless manner. 
I guess the, the gap I'm trying to figure out is to get to LOI, you got to model this out, your CapEx and synergies. And then it seems like the people that really know that stuff, your functional leads get pulled in after you sign the LOI. So I'm, I'm trying to get that picture of how, how do you balance that out? How do you accurately get an offer on the table? I can understand how, how you, you can struggle with that, but I think we've done enough deals that we under, we know the parameters of, of what it is that we need to make a deal work. So we know that if a company is bleeding $10 million and doing 30 million in revenue, it's probably not a company that we're going to be able to get to the kind of operating margin that we needed to get to. So we tend to look at companies that have a different um, operating margin profile. We look at companies where we know that, you know, maybe the company is spending 50% of revenue on sales and marketing. We know, and they're growing five, 10%. We know that's not efficient. So we know that we can do that much better. Same thing on the GNA side. You know, maybe they're um, they've got seven different facilities, but no one's going into the office. We know we can operate that better. So there are a lot of things that we can understand at a high level when we're looking at a deal that can give us conviction around certain assumptions. But you're right. Then we go in and, and the the teams, the functions who have to live with it, need to go in and validate it and come back to us and say, yes, I can do this, or no, I can't do this. And if they say, no, I can't do this, then there are harder discussions where maybe we look for puts and takes across other parts of the business. Or, you know, ultimately we say, we can't make the deal model work and we have to walk away. I mean, it's rare that we have to do that because we know so well what we're doing and we know so well where we can extract operational efficiency. So there's a high degree of conviction, even with a limited set of folks who are evaluating the business before we get into an LOI stage. Finance ultimately drives all this activity to get to an LOI in terms of the, the valuation. So we work very closely with the executive champion and the finance team to build out our assumptions and to build okay, so out the model. business sponsor. It, it is not effective if we just let the finance team say this is the model and go live with it. There's a lot of inputs that come from us as the corp dev team the executive champion with input that that executive champion has from the couple of folks that they have that are evaluating the business. And you can set a basic set of assumptions from that. If we were to just to let finance tell us this is what the model is, that would be ineffective. Okay, so it's like very, a triangle. Very interactive dialogue. You got business unit leadership, finance, and Jeremy, uh, Corp Def. It's sort of between the three to really agree on a evaluation model to put a bid in. Oh, we, and, and then obviously reviewing that with the CEO and the CFO um, and making sure that they are comfortable with the numbers that we're talking about as well. <clears throat> and then we'll submit a bid. And then does it continue to live on where as you go through confirmatory diligence, are you updating that model as you the, get more information from functionally? The deal model definitely evolves um, and it definitely gets more refined. Um, and that deal model, and one of the great reasons, one of the key reasons why we have finance that ultimately owns it is because that deal model is going to eventually transition into an operating model. And so we want to have really good understanding of all the different inputs um, and all the different assumptions that are going into that model. Because at the end of the day, you know, the business unit and the business unit's finance partner are going to live with, uh, live with those numbers. So they need to be comfortable with them. How do you make sure your bids are accurate? You don't miss a big CapEx or Synergy. Um, you know, that's a good question. Um, you know, it's you know, don't tell me it's years of doing this. I want to know. <laughs> I want to shortcut that. I want to make sure it doesn't take me. Yeah, uh, no, I mean, we're having good dialogue. I mean, we're having enough dialogue before we submit an LOI that we have a good enough understanding of different aspects of the business. You know, if it's a CapEx heavy business, if it's a customer support heavy business, if it's heavily dependent on cloud hosting costs. Um, you know, if they're spending a lot of money on demand gen, um, you know, if they have a crazy um, sales um, model with, you know, multi levels of, of, of folks involved in deals like a VP, a director, an actual salesperson. Um, so we have a lot of things that we know um, and a lot of questions that we know we can ask to get enough insight to be able to um, build out a, a preliminary model. What are examples of those? big things, ticket items in, in those categories of CapEx and synergies that you'd probably pay attention to and want to make sure you get right? 
Yeah, I mean, there are a lot. I mean, on the on the cost of goods sold side, I mean, if they um, are using a third party provider like an AWS or an Azure or a Google Cloud, we want to understand what are those relationships? What are the dependencies? Are they just using it for compute and storage? Are they using it for other support? Um, you know, that can influence our ability to get synergies. Um, when it comes to, um, you know, facilities and having a whole bunch of office locations, we ask a lot of questions around, um, is it more of a virtual environment? Is it a work in the office environment? We know we can get potential synergies there. You know, we ask a lot of questions to really dig in and understand what are the key marketing initiatives that drive top line. Um, we can understand where we can get um, synergies there. Same thing on the sales side. You know, um, it, you know, sometimes the ratios of sales to SEs and sales to account managers are just out of whack. And so there are lots of things that we can look for that allow us to say, hey, you know, here's a clear area where we can get synergy. If it's a product that is similar to a product within progress, we know we can leverage our sales team to basically just add that to the bag. So maybe there's not as big a dependency on another sales team. So there are a whole bunch of things that as we evaluate a company can allow us to sort of think about where their potential um, opportunities for synergies or not. And it's all within those executive leadership that you got a pretty good handle in terms of understanding the business. And obviously a lot of it's mapped out through financials you're reviewing. Yeah, I mean, if, if we see a company and they've got 60% sales, 60% uh, of revenue and sales and marketing and their growth rate is sub 10%, we know there's something off kilter there. You know, if we see a company and they've got G&A that spend uh, north of 20%, we know that there are lots of efficiencies there. Um, you know, on the R&D side, you know, we know that if, they, if their R&D is high, maybe they have high cost R&D people and we can move those uh costs to some of the other places where we have centers of excellence for development, like Bangalore or, um, or Sofia, Bulgaria, or other places where we do development. So there are a bunch of levers that we can, that we can look at as we build out these models. And that gives us that conviction. I know it, it sounds weird that, you know, you can have that level of insight that early before you let all of the different functional folks go off and hit the ground running. But at the same time, we need to have some perspective because we need to be able to assess whether or not we can, one, get to the kind of operating margin profile we need, and two, you know, get to the kind of price that's going to resonate with the with the seller and the seller's investors. That's why they always blame you for everything uh, when it comes to all the post-close activity. <laughs> we yeah. can't deliver in all these synergies. What were they thinking? Uh, tell me about negotiations. When you are going to put this offer in front of the 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 target, are you doing it with this? Hey, I'm going to put five percent padding to negotiate on this. Like, what, what, how does that work? Oh yeah, absolutely. I, I'm never. I'm. I'm when I'm when, when I'm working on a deal. I mean, you know, I'm never going to necessarily give them the highest bid out of the gate um, because then there's no room for negotiation. So, you know, I, I definitely need to have some room for, for being able to move and to make it um, more of a negotiation between both sides. Um, so I usually have a, a really good, a good perspective of what my range is that I can do a deal in. And, and so if we can get something, get alignment um, within that zip code, um, you know, then you can have a conversation. If if they're in zip code X and I'm in zip code Y, then we can say, well, you know, we're never going to be able to get there. So let's agree to let's let's agree to part ways now rather than waste cycles. What does that look like? Is it like a percentage range, or are you just taking your top divided by two, and that's where you start I mean, with? It, it, it really it varies. It, it varies. I mean, some there are situations where you know we just want to come in with as strong a bit as we can because maybe it's a competitive situation we need to. Um, you know, there are situations where, well, you know, we're filling each other out, so we're going to throw out a number, but we know we can move on it. So it really varies based on the the, the situation, the company that you're having a conversation with. I know no. you don't like that because it's not as specific. And, it's fine. I can live with it. What with, about with a specific situation? percentage? But I mean, it really, it, it really varies. It varies from deal to deal and what it is we're trying to accomplish. Well, progress is not an acquirer that can typically preempt a process because we aren't out there paying crazy high multiples for deals because we can't because we don't trade at a crazy high multiple so you, you know anyone that's selling to us sort of has a 
should have a basic understanding of where we're going to be from a value standpoint, because we need that deal to be accretive and they should know where we trade at from a revenue multiple standpoint, from an EBITDA multiple standpoint. And the only way we're going to create shareholder value is by paying a multiple um, that's lower. than that. So that's uh what about if it's a, a situation, if you know the company's in trouble, like we're probably going to see a lot of companies coming up. Is that, do you still play it by, hey, this is what market's going for? Or do I look at the situation and saying they don't have a choice? Yeah, I mean, again, that's a great point. And, and there, I mean, there could be opportunities where we can get assets for cheaper prices than we may have been able to get last year. And that's just the, that's this, the result of the market environment, the market dynamics. It's interesting. Um, private companies, I, don't, I still don't think there's that equilibrium between what sellers want and what um, buyers are willing to pay. Um, there's definitely more um, correction happening in the public markets and in the private markets, but it's only a matter of time. You're right before those private companies say, hey, I'm going to have a really hard time going out and raising more money. If I do raise more money, um, it's going to be a very disadvantageous um, terms from the VC who for the last two to three years had to give me all kinds of great um, rights. So now that the VCs are in a position of power, maybe it is a good time to sell because I'm better off selling now because in order for me to make the same amount of money, I'll have to get to a valuation three, four times where I'm at today. So yeah, I think there are going to be a lot more companies that are going to at least be willing to engage and explore that. And I think, you know, you certainly, if you read um, the, the journal or the pitch book or any of these publications on a daily basis, I mean, it's very clear that, you know, VCs are being much tighter with who it is that they fund. Um, they're funding much um, less on the mature companies, which is where we focus because we're looking for companies with scale. So those companies are going to be in position once they get to that point where they're going to run out of money where they don't have an option. You're right. And we're going to be a, a, a good viable option for them. Are there other things you're negotiating on your LOI besides purchase price? It's a good question. It depends. I mean, there are certainly... Um, LOIs where the seller wants to negotiate more up front, they at least want to get some visibility into um, what are the gotchas from a purchase price adjustment standpoint. So give me a feel for what you're going to do with networking capital. Um, there are certainly um, situations where, you know, the seller or the, the, the banker wants to know that you're going to commit to procuring rep and warranty insurance um, as your recourse for indemnity. Um, so that can get negotiated uh, during the LOI stage. Um, we're trying to negotiate exclusivity. If we can get exclusivity, that's great. Um, it's hard to, you know, expend hundreds of thousands of dollars on diligence resources and not know if you're even going to win the deal. Um, but sometimes in super competitive situations, you need to do that. But when they're not as competitive, you're trying to get that exclusivity period. Um, so that's important, something you negotiate. Um, you'll talk about high level on structure, um, but again, a lot of the structure stuff is dependent on you know, the tax work that you do and digging in more deeply in some of the legal um, aspects of the target company. So it's hard to really have a lot of visibility there. Um, we try to make it clear that you know we're gonna take good care of the people um, that we um, retain in the deal. Um, and so we usually put together some sort of package of retention for them and that's negotiated uh, um, in the LOI. So you, you, you're hearing that there are certainly a few things. It's rare that you can get someone to sign up for an LOI or an indication of interest where you're basically just saying, here's the price and I want exclusivity. They want a little bit more detail. Um, and so you have to negotiate. I, I don't get how you do a deal without exclusivity if you are got to invest so much time and resources to get to close. It's, it's a great point. I would say that up until three or four years ago, I never would have done it. Um, but in competitive situations that are banker led, where there are three, four, five parties that are all seriously reviewing a deal, these bankers are requiring diligence to be primarily complete before they get before him, before they select um, the winning party. And in those situations, you know, some, you have to make the decision. Is it worth it to me to put our best foot forward to potentially win this deal and thus incur these costs knowing that I might not get this deal or is it not? And do I just walk away because I'm not going to incur those costs because I don't think I really have a good chance of winning the deal anyways, or I'm just not comfortable incurring all these costs on the deal. So 
but you're right. It, it's, it's, it's a very, very tough balancing act, um, which is why, you know, we, we try to find more proactive opportunities, you know, where there's not a process um, or a banker led process so that we can control that and have that exclusivity period. So if it is proprietary, you would tend to get exclusivity. Exclusivity. Yes. Um, and typically, yeah, we, we want on a, on a deal that we source and find ourselves. Um, we're not going to go through all that work without exclusivity. What good do bankers do in this world? What good do they do? Yeah. What good do bankers do in this world? Um, well, um, they usually um, can have a much more robust data room in place when you initially start doing diligence um, in a proactive process where the company isn't really teed up to sell. Um, the information trickles in a little bit more um, you know, in a more formal process. There's a much more robust data room with a lot more of the detail that we're going to be looking for in a diligence process. So that's good. Um, they also bring a level of experience that particularly sometimes... Um, entrepreneurs or sellers who are newer to that process don't really know what they're doing and so sometimes can um, sort of get ahead of their skis Um, and so bankers can keep them a little bit more balanced um, and a little bit more focused on what it is that we're trying to accomplish in a deal that can help you know I had a situation where a company did not have a banker um, and it was really difficult to negotiate with them because they just had never done this before. They didn't know what they were doing. You know, we were months down the road with this company and they got cold feet with regards to valuation. I mean, this is something that you should address early in a process when you sign an LOI, not when you're about to sign a definitive agreement. Would so you, a banker wouldn't let something like that happen. Would you do a proprietary deal and encourage a company that you felt was going down that path to find a banker? That's a great banker? question. Um, you know, as long as, as long as I get that exclusivity, um, and, you know, have that period and they're not going to go market the deal and then come back to me, um, and you can now sign first yeah. and then say you should yeah. probably work with so, a bank. Yeah. Um, I, so I do think there's value to it. Um, especially, I mean, if it's a, if it's a CEO who's been through it before and knows what they're doing and has processes in place and, um, has all the materials sort of easily accessible, then great. Then they don't need it if they've never done it before and they don't know the first thing to doing a diligence process, then it it might not hurt. Do you use these different components in an LOI uh, as different levers in a combination? So I'm thinking of my approach to buying a house. I will go out and low bid, very low in purchase price, but all cash offer, no contingencies. I'm closing in five days. And I'm all looking for is to see if they counter. If they counter, then I'm throwing back my contingencies and, and other variables and get that price significantly lower where most people Absolutely. Are. Absolutely. I am definitely focusing on some of the other pieces like speed, like being able to get to a deal quickly, like certainty to close. So, you know, our willingness to do rep and warranty insurance, having a lot more flexibility on deal terms that are much more aligned with market today versus say market three or four years ago. So I'm highlighting those pieces and saying, you know, these are the things that, you know, differentiate us because, you know, price is one piece, but if you're going to go down a process with this other acquirer, that's going to take two months to diligence you, I can do that in 20 days. I can do that in 30 days. And in the same time I can negotiate a deal and Hey, you know, I have the cash on hand because I have a balance sheet with over half a billion dollars in cash. Um, and so you're not going to have to worry about financing con- contingencies and other things like that. So absolutely, I will, I will leverage those things as much as possible and highlight. Is there, ever, is there ever hesitation on reps and warranties from either side? No, not really. Um, it, it's, it's an interesting, it, I, we just did a, a presentation this morning um, to our legal team and we were talking about how rep warranty insurance is, is basically table stakes today. I mean, in most deals, it's sort of just expected. So we've, got, we've gotten comfortable with it as, as a vehicle for giving us the protections that we need. Um, and so it's, it, it isn't really um, a sticking point for us on deals Whereas in the past, it may have been. You ever had a deal where even before LOI and you're just proposing the idea of doing acquisition and they were like, nah, and then you convinced them to say, yeah, has you ever had that where you've actually had to convince someone that wasn't for sale to sell? 
Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, and some of these uh, bootstrap situations that I was alluding to, um, it was a very long courtship period. Um, and you know, it's interesting. Sometimes there are two or three founders, maybe one or two are all on board with selling. And the third one is not necessarily as sure. And so you need to work extra hard at convincing that party why selling makes sense. You know, um, So those kinds of scenarios have definitely played out. What is that? Where did the things are there? Is it the story of growing together? You'll still get a, a lot of upsides. You know, what, what are those things that really get someone to change their mind? Yeah. I mean, it will, if, if say the person's are in their sixties and they're sort of on the final legs of, of wanting to work, you know, it's a great liquidity event um, and a great opportunity to, um, you know, go off and enjoy um, other things. Um, you know, it is all about, you know, having a, a bigger platform and what the bigger platform provides, you know, a, a small company that's been bootstrapped with maybe a couple hundred customers is going to salivate over the opportunity to be able to bring that to hundred thousand customers. Um, so yeah, there's, there's that platform. Um, and there's just all the additional pieces that come with being a public company for their people, you know, being able to have a more robust 401k plan, being able to have um, stock in a public company that actually has liquid, liquid liquidity, as opposed to being a piece of paper that could never be worth anything. Um, so there are a whole bunch of different levers that you can sort of um, call out as reasons why, you know, maybe you should give more serious thought to this. Um, it sounds like a great you know, topic to bring you back on. <laughs> <laughs> great. Uh, yeah, I, that, no, that was... I, know, I know we're getting close to time here. Uh, can I ask what's the craziest thing you've seen in m You always ask me that. I, I'd say that I go back to this one, the craziest thing where, you know, this company, like, months down the road of, of getting to a definitive agreement and having everything pretty much buttoned up, you know, decided that the valuation wasn't sufficient. Um, that company will definitely regret that decision because this was pre the markets doing what they've done and, and pre valuations coming down. Um, but you know, that happens. Um, and so people are crazy. Um, and I would say, you know, um, early stage or not early stage, but, um, Entrepreneurs who don't have any experience with a deal process tend to be the ones that get into the most trouble. Um, and that's happened to me a couple of times. And, you know, the last thing you want to do um, as a seller is come to the buyer right before you're going to sign a definitive agreement and say, I'm not comfortable with the value. Because you've had plenty of time to discuss that and plenty <laughs> of time to negotiate that. And it's no longer the time when you're signing a getting ready to sign a definitive agreement. But we've, I've had, Two situations where um, founders have said, I'm not comfortable with value at the last minute. And that's a deal breaker. Like, I guess okay. I want the LOI, but definitive agreement. That's uh, yeah. Like, all right. Hey, you know, all the power to you. Um, and um, in that first case, um, the person came back to us six months later and we were like, sorry, you had your window. Good luck. In the second case, they haven't come back to us yet, but I suspect they will. This has been great, Jeremy. Thanks for taking the time to chat with me. I learned a lot, helping me become a better m and scientist. Oh, you always ask great questions and tough questions, Kisan, so I appreciate it. Uh, hopefully, uh, I shared some uh, good insights and, um, and look forward to the next one with you. Hey, those of you still with us, cheers. Here's to the deal.